Whoa, mama. Whoa, slow down. Let's go. Hey guys, before we get into it, I want to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Scentbird. Scentbird is a new way to discover, shop for, and experience fragrances. As a drag artist, I feel like in addition to looking good, you should also smell good. And since I've started partnering with Scentbird, I have found so many new fragrances for my drag. Using their online store, you can find new fragrances to try each month. With easy to read descriptions, which include the notes, what seasons or occasions they work best with, and reviews from other users, that way you don't have any surprises. Each month, Scentbird will send you a 30-day supply of a designer fragrance of your choice, that way you can try it out before committing to buying an entire bottle. And it's not just cheap mall fragrances either. They have indie labels like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of a Rebel, and name brands like Prada, Gucci, and Versace. And it's only $17 a month, which means that fragrances that can cost upwards of $500 a bottle, you can try a 30-day supply for just $17. These are a few of the fragrances that I tried this month. First was Leonora by Mind Games. This one was more of a fresh, like summery fragrance. It had like notes of passion fruit in it. It was like a lighter sweet smell, but not too overwhelming. It was something that I could definitely see myself using for like brunch shows. And next was this one by Edeniste. I'm not gonna try to pronounce it because I just know I'm gonna butcher it. But this one had a very fresh, grapefruity, like citrusy smell. And while I like the smell of citrus, I feel like this one might've been just a little too strong for me because I do prefer more kind of lighter smells, but it wasn't bad. And last was Gold by Commodity. So this one was actually a unisex fragrance. This one was definitely more of like a warm fall scent. It really didn't fit the vibe of me for drag, but I can honestly see myself wearing this just in my day to day. It's like a good, light fragrance that's not overly masculine, but it still doesn't smell like a straight up perfume. Of the three, I think Leonora was definitely my favorite of this batch. And you can find your new favorite too, and at a discount. You can scan the QR code or use my coupon code 55MADDIE to get up to 55% off your first month at Scentbird. That's just a little over $7 for your first month, available in the US and Canada. And now, on to the video. Hey guys, welcome back to Give It To Me Straight. I'm your host, Maddie Morphosis, and when I'm with my guests, I say yes, mama. <laughs> <laughs> oh, joining, oh shit. Joining me on the show today is renowned drag artist, choreographer, and legend so many... icon, sickening doll. Yeah. <laughs> Known for appearances with many things, including So You Think You Can Dance and, of course, RuPaul's Drag Race. It is Laganja Estranja. Yes, God, honey. She's here. She's queer. And she brought her little furry friend. You know, I know you've had many dogs. Up right. on the show, <laughs> right. so now you can say you've had an actual canine. I, I, this is our first uh, fur, fur baby that we've had in the show today. So, oh you know. well, Dabbers is you know just as much a part of my brand as everything else. So I'm happy she could be here with us today. I'm, I'm really surprised. We were talking earlier about the dog that like you know this dog is with you everywhere. I'm yeah. surprised you haven't got her like the little vest and like the, all the certification and stuff. You know, back in the day, she was considered um, like a su emotional support animal, and like I could get her on the plane for free. But now they make that so much harder. You have to like, mm. I don't even know, show your doctor's notes and make sure the dog can do all these tricks. And so we just gave up on it. Yeah, I know. We just she gave up on children. It. It's just a whole thing. No, you she know? definitely She's... doesn't attack children. And you know, <laughs> she does have a Versace collar. So she doesn't have a vest, but she is draped in Versace. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so for anyone that's uh, not watching but listening to the audio version, we're going to describe these outfits that we have going on right yes. now. Because uh, you actually loaned me an outfit for this interview today because I was going to dress down a little bit. No. Still very much in theme, but I was not expecting you to be as grandiose as you it are It was going to give House of Bezos, basically. A little bit. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> well, I... It, it was giving one day shipping. Okay, right, you know? right, right. We love the prime. Yeah, prime well, I drag. just really wanted to come correct for you as well. I feel like I you it. have such an amazing show here and I just wanted to show all your buds what I've been up to. I appreciate it. Yeah. And you're like, I'm going to be sitting down for this interview for probably like an hour and a half or so. Uh, oh, what's the one outfit I can't sit properly in? Perfect. Like, that would be the one. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did it's... something just fall? I felt an earring. I have this like PTSD where something's always going to fall off. It's oh, because I'm untucked. It's yeah. like it's triggered. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. No, I think everything, just... everything seems like it's pieced together. Okay. But <laughs> pieced if, if, together. If, if something... I caught the shade there. <laughs> if something does fall off, I will make sure let to me know. keep it. Yes. Love yeah. that for yeah, me. Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, so like for the audio listeners, I am dressed in my um, cannabis finest, my finest cannabis wear. That's all they get. Let yes. me do this part. Okay, so listeners. Describe it for them. Break it down for them. Listeners, she is in thigh-high black boots with a gorgeous custom sequin leotard with a ginormous 
banana leaf protruding from her poussoir, with black lines giving her the shape of a goddess. She is adorned with a green puff wig, custom created by Misty G Wigs, and her makeup is snatched for filth in the shade green. You see how you do that? Okay, now break down the, uh, the, the... Well, I had asked you before we started filming, like, are you gonna go in the ganja green? Because I saw with all your episodes that you like to, like, kind of do an ode to the girl. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I feel like, you know, you should be the ganja and I should be the light, the incensador, you know, the flame of it all. Mm. So I am wearing fully custom head to toe from the shoes to the gloves to the nails to the, you know, corsetry. I mean, everything is fully custom created by my dear friend in Thailand, Arms. And I'm wearing a beautiful custom wig by, fuck, who made the wig? It's a new designer. I just started working with them. <laughs> fuck. Well, we'll tag We could just we'll do like out. a little. Um... I'll put a little at right here. Okay, perfect. It was made by this Made person. by. I'll put a little twinkle sound there effect. There it is, It'll be great. perfect. Like yeah. <laughs> So just to sum it up for you, she is a fire gym leader from the newest Pokemon game, and I am the third Wachowski sister. Perfect. So, there yeah. it is. <laughs> so yeah, your name itself, it whenever I heard the name Laganja Estranja, I assumed yeah. it was like a strain of cannabis, but it's okay. not. No. Have they named one after you yet that you know of? Not that I know of. I know some companies have sold pre-rolls with the name Laganja, mm -hmm. but I don't think we have an official like Laganja strain of cannabis just yet. Mm -hmm. I've been working on it for many years, but, you know, everyone in the cannabis industry is, well, high. And right. so, you know, the follow through is not excellent. Is, is that like, you've had so many ventures and so many, yeah. like, different, like, deals and things you've done. Like, getting out your own strain, is that's hard hoops to jump through. It's hard to make yeah, that happen. Yeah, it is. I mean, you got to have a lot of money, A, which, oh. you know, I may look like I have a lot of money, but I don't. Yeah. So, I uh, thought you just slapped your name on some skunk weed. I didn't know that you had to go through all these. You could do that. I've just never wanted to do that. Okay. I've always known that when I finally launched my cannabis brand that I wanted to be fully created and like fully custom and fully original to who I am. So I'm still working on it. It's still in the plans. Mm -hmm. Just give me some time. And uh, any, um, you know, funders out there want to throw a dime at the doll, mm -hmm. I'm there. Stay tuned, everyone. Laganja Estranja coming to a prescription near you. Exactly. Yeah, it's coming. Exactly. It's happening. <laughs> but of all the queens in the franchise, there's so many of them that are taking cannabis, but yeah. I feel like none of them are as strongly associated with it as yeah. you are. But you actually didn't even start partaking in cannabis until your 20s. Yeah, pretty much. I, you know, my sister, my older sister definitely like grew up smoking pot and I was told it was the devil's lettuce and it was like a bad mm -hmm. thing. So I pretty much stayed away from it until I was a senior in high school. So I was probably like 17, 18, mm -hmm. but I didn't really like get into cannabis officially and get my medical license at that time which was the only way you could smoke in California until I was around 20 mm -hmm. and was a, a sophomore in college, yeah. That was based off the advice of a chiro chiropractor, right? For your pain mitigation? I you said a <laughs> head. <laughs> no, well, I mean, yes. it could have been. We can't rule that out. Yes, you know? yes. Uh, yeah, I was a chiropractor, actually. I was in a uh, dance piece. I went to mm -hmm. school for dance and choreography, and I was up in a lift, and they dropped me by accident on my tailbone. So oh. I kind of like my tailbone was like this basically. So I had to see a chiropractor to shift it back into place. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that suggested while I was going through all these, you know, alignments to try cannabis to alleviate the pain. Mm. And that was when I really realized like, oh, this thing is a medicine. It's not just a party drug. And I started taking it more serious. Do you still have like issues with your tailbone? Is that still like an ongoing um, issue? No complaints. No? Yeah, no. No, yeah, that's fine. I mean, humans don't have tails. We don't have tails anymore, so it's yeah, fine. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're right. Exactly. Yeah, no. I think it's pretty good. I think after all the adjustments and lots and lots of cannabis, we're good. Mm -hmm. But in addition to, like, the pain mitigation, you've also talked about how it helped to, like, your mood and, like, your mental state. Yes. What, what was happening in your life around the time that you really started to lean into it where it, that it helped alleviate? Well, I think this has also shifted for me now that I really have perspective. I think in the beginning, I definitely told people that I use cannabis to help with my depression. Mm -hmm. But I think now in looking back, I realized that I was actually using cannabis to sort of suppress my emotions on how I felt about my gender. So I think mm -hmm. in a way, I actually was not using it as medicine and I was using it more as a numbing agency. Dabby's, come over here. <laughs> She's like, I need attention. Oh my gosh. Um, 
And so, yeah, I, I think now my relationship to cannabis has really changed because I am living my authentic self mm -hmm. and I don't feel the need to just get like blasted when I wake up in the morning. You know, I used to like do the gas mask with the bong connected to it, like mm -hmm. right off the bat when I would wake up. And I do think a lot of that, while I called it medication, it was really to suppress who I was and, and the kind of hardships I faced with coming to terms with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't realize your relationship with uh, cannabis and your gender identity was so like interwoven together. Yeah, so I, I think I, I thought these would be two completely different topics. Oh so. yeah, no, <laughs> that's why because I was going to talk about your obviously like, your gender journey sure. later in the the interview. So sure, I didn't realize. No, so I don't know. I want to piece them together. No, yeah, I think the two really correlate, and I think ultimately, you know, cannabis expanded my mind. I know that sounds so stonery of me to say, but it's the truth. It really allowed me to become myself and to really accept who I am today as a trans woman. I, I'm learning stuff. Like I, here I think I'm doing all the heavy research and I'm- You know, smoke you know. a joint and you just too might come out as trans. That's, the, Fox News was right. <laughs> they were right. They're putting they're putting the uh, uh, chemicals in the cannabis yeah. that turns the kids trans. It turns, it turns, turns the frogs trans. It turns them, mama. Yeah. <laughs> so take us back to whatever you were younger though. Little baby okay. JB. Uh-huh. Like, were, were you like the way you are now? Were you like that as a child? Or was yeah. there a time when you were normal? No, I've never been normal. I've always been eccentric. I've always, you know, lived outside of the sandbox, colored outside of the lines, been mm -hmm. crazy, been kooky. I grew up in musical theater. My parents realized at an early age that I was uh, different. Some might say mm -hmm. gifted. Um, and so they put me in musical theater camps and I just fell in love and I just loved being able to showcase all the different sides of me through dance and singing and acting and costuming. And I think that's why drag came so naturally to me because it was just sort of that next level of taking it to the like crazy degree. Mm -hmm. Almost like a monogamation of all the things that you were already interested in. And then even seed in the back of your head expressing femininity. Exactly. Is, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think that's also sort of like what drag was for me was a way to explain my femininity to myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in a place where being a sissy was not a good thing. And so when I started drag, it was like, oh, okay, like drag is my job. It was a way for me to be like, okay, this isn't really who I am. It's just like what I do, it's just my job. Um, and through the many years of doing it, I realized like, oh, actually that's not so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But growing up as like a young queer child outside of Dallas, yeah. obviously Texas is not the most open-minded of places, no. even, even in a blue city like Dallas. Sure. What were some kind of the hardships you experienced growing up as such like an openly effeminate child? Yeah, I mean, I definitely got made fun of just like most queer individuals. Um, and I definitely got picked on for being different. But I was so lucky that I had parents who supported what I did and really believed in me and made sure that I could get the classes and the training to develop the skills that I have now. So, you know, I hated really going to school, but Every time I would leave school and go to like, you know, musical theater practice after mm -hmm. school, that's where I really began to flourish and, and find love for myself. Mm -hmm. But as you said, your parents were really supportive of you. Yeah. But your older sister, who's also queer, yeah. kind of like was the one that blazed that trail for you and did the trials and tribulations before you. Oh, totally. What were the differences in, that you experienced with your upbringing, your sister versus you? Well, I always say that like my sister was sort of the guinea pig, <laughs> unfortunately, as she was the one that you know, didn't get um, all of the things that I got, right? I think my parents learned with her what not to do. Mm -hmm. And so I was really lucky, you know? I was able to have my boyfriends over for dinner. I was able to, you know, express myself to a degree. I mean, I definitely, you know, my dad would worry about me acting queer in mm -hmm. public, not because he was ashamed, but more because he didn't want me to get ridiculed by others. Right. Um, but I really do think that like I was so lucky and that she came first and she did, as you said, burn the trails for me so that I could walk through the path with no problem. Yeah, you're yeah. Like, she, she got B, so you didn't have to. You yeah. know, she took her lumps, yeah. she took one for the yeah, team. No, no beatings per se, but definitely, <laughs> you know, I had more support when it came to being queer. But like as a child, like you said, they were very supportive of you and you were always this really outgoing, energetic, you know, little queer child. Yeah. Were you like putting on little dance performances like in the living room? Completely. Just trying to be like the girl in the Missy Elliott videos? Oh, and... always. I mean, I, <laughs> Missy Elliott, my favorite. So of mm -hmm. course that, but like definitely, you know, my best friend and I were so creative. I mean, we would make like restaurants and have full on menus and like 
you know, do a whole presentation for our parents and serve them horrible food that we had concocted in the kitchen. And, you know, we were making little skits and movies before that was even like a popular thing to do. So, yeah, I definitely have always been an artist. Do you agree? <laughs> do you want to come over here? I, I think she wants to go to your lab, but there's so many things. I know. But it's not, it's not, I'm it's... wondering if I should take one of my things off. Well, I mean, we have to stay monetized. I don't know how much we can, you know, take No, just here. like one piece. You know, I just want to give the audience a reveal. Just a little flavor. Is that okay? <laughs> can I do that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's this see. This is your moment. Have me, it. This is my moment? Have I it. love that. Do, 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 do. Hold on. I don't want to break the nails. Oh, so close. That's a little bit you're taking off. No, wait. Okay, good. We're not going to mess with the mic. Yeah, I just feel like they got the picture. Yeah. And it's adding so much weight. We got the big piece for the uh, the thumbnail. Okay. Here, do 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 do. Oh, wow! Look at that reveal, honey. Giving oh, giving more body for the dolls. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so much more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay, not yeah. really. That's a lie. Now we can breathe, we can sit. I mean, sit not really. There's this like thing just going up my crotch that is just so hateful. This is definitely like meant to be a dance outfit. Ooh, yes, queen. That is what it needed. Let it breathe. And we're ready. <laughs> okay, Dabbers, come here now. Come on. I just took all that off. Oh. Wow. wow. She, you know, I think it's because you're dressed like I normally am. Oh, so she might be okay. a little confused. Maybe. She thinks you're a mama. Yeah. It's like, huh? <laughs> yeah, some kids have two mamas. That's right. That's, yeah. We love that. <laughs> but when did you start really getting into like dance and theater specifically? Oh my gosh. Probably like seven years old. My parents tried me in sports, of course. Mm -hmm. And I did soccer for a while. I was like the goalie. Mm -hmm. Hated. Um, but you know, the minute they moved me into a dance studio where I had a mirror and I could look at myself and there was air conditioning, it was a wrap. Mm. I saw a video on a TikTok today of a, a kid that was playing like t-ball, like a five-year-old. Okay. Hits the ball and it starts slowly running to the base and it just starts doing cartwheels. And that's what I imagine it was like you playing soccer. It was just oh. like a lot of that. I was just fully in the goalie area, like giving shows and stunts. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Plus my team was so good. So no one ever really like would even mm. get the ball close to the goalie, which is why I think they put me there. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, it was, it was a... Yeah. Uh, Hot mess, They're, for sure. Your team was out there holding it down on the field, and you were doing the Vogue choreography. Down. And Madonna, yeah. Down, absolutely. <laughs> Although I was doing more like Britney choreo. Madonna appreciation didn't come until later in my life. Okay, that's fair. That's yeah. Fair. But the high school that you went to is actually a performance arts high school. Yes. And it's actually where a couple other Drag Race alumni went to. Yeah. Elliot with two T's. Yes. Kennedy Davenport. Yes. So it's definitely a, a, a hub for dancing divas. It is. Did that school, did it really lay down the foundations of your performance style, like have an impact on how you perform or was it just kind of like the entry point for you? I think Booker T. Washington High School for the Performing and Visual Arts changed my life. It really did, you know? It's where I discovered the, my love of choreography. I choreographed for the musical theater group called The Entertainers. And I also like really fully developed, I think my love of just being behind the scenes. I think so many people know me as like the person on stage and I do love that, don't get me wrong, but definitely now as I'm getting older, I'm just so much more interested in being behind the scenes and being a part of more of the creative vision and the creation than having to be the package itself. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, your dance background is so much more extensive than just like what they saw on Drag Race. Right. Like, it's more than just like the death drops. It's also yes. like a lot of like interpretive dance. And you know, we call those dips. Oh, did I say death drops? Uh -huh. Oh, I think I've been watching too many interviews from <laughs> my season old interviews. Six. Yeah, think, yeah, those like interviews. Yeah, yeah. No, I just always love to point that out because you know ballroom culture is something that I've never really been a part of, but mm -hmm. that I have such an appreciation for. Mm -hmm. And so when I got off the show, and that community really educated me on that, um, I felt like it's now sort of my not my job, but my opportunity, right, to just make sure that the people are using the right terms. And that we're really like paying ode to the culture that so many of us are now kind of riffing on and creating our own spaces with. Mm -hmm. but, but with like the dancing styles that you know, do you feel yeah. like the songs that you had to perform on Drag Race weren't the best ones to showcase where your talents actually lied? Oh gosh, I don't even remember them. <laughs> I know one of them was Pink, Stupid Girls, mm -hmm. um, which I love Pink, so I was totally down with that. But I think that was me and Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. 
What did Gia and I lip sync to? I think it was head to toe. Something like this, very <laughs> 80s. I mean, you know, look, if you're an artist, it doesn't matter what song you're given. That's mm. how I really feel. I mean, obviously, I was so grateful when I went back to All Stars and they gave me physical. Mm. And I, like, got to have a song that was popular and vibing and really, like, you know, more current. But... I feel like as an artist, like I love a challenge. And so, yeah, I, I think no matter what song you serve me, I'm going to definitely slay. What's the most like unexpected song that you would just destroy that people wouldn't even expect? Like some weird oddball interpretive dance. I was about to say, like, I definitely did do a lot of interpretive dance back in my day yeah. when I would like really push the envelope more. Um, and I did some songs that like didn't even have lyrics, you know, that were just mm -hmm. like beautiful piano pieces of music. Um, I definitely also did like Chandelier by Sia and I did all the original mm -hmm. choreography that like Maddie Ziegler did. I think that definitely surprised people who don't like really follow my journey. People don't know you would fuck up a Chopin. Like down. Like, yeah. I love Chopin. Some some Debussy. Some it's Debussy over. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> But on top of like all the dancing divas that went to the same high school as you, yeah. you actually graduated with another, I would say like online celebrity, uh, Mark Rebillé. Oh my God, yes. You always do your research. That's why I love the show. So yes, AKA Loop Daddy, mm -hmm. incredible artist. Like he went to our school for, I believe, theater. And now he's like making the most amazing music. And I love his videos. Like the mm -hmm. way he goes out into the street and just like, Basically, if you've never seen his video, he he has this like keyboard that he's able to like create loops on, and then he'll have like drum pads and all sorts of like sort of electronical vibes to create music. And he'll go in public and like put on these big shows, and people come around and they'll have instruments and they jo join in on the jam, and it's so cool. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he's totally skyrocketed. Yeah, I noticed he went to the same high school as you and even graduated the same year. Yeah. But then I noticed on like some of your posts that he would like comment on a couple of them. Yeah, no, like, we, oh, we, sick. we still keep in touch. And I mean, I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but, you know, we know each other because of the Gaja connection. Let's mm. just put it that way. I, I don't think he'd be upset. <laughs> I think everyone already assumes that about him. Yeah. You know, I think people would. Yeah, yeah. He, he definitely had, you know, the hookup and and took care of your girl. <laughs> mm, okay, so oh, he he was the hookup. I mean, I'm not saying that. I might be insinuating it, but yeah. yeah. I mean, like that also <laughs> tracks like anyone whose like career is going a public in boxers and a bathrobe. Right. If you tell me that person, you know, sold to the kids in high school, that's <laughs> that's yeah. he is literally the same person now that he was then, and I think that's also what makes me so happy too is just to see someone being successful and being authentically who they are. You know, he mm -hmm. was always funny and bizarre and irreverent. And I'm just so glad that so many people have like latched on and gotten into the vibe because yeah, he's so fun, mm -hmm. so awesome. And definitely one of the coolest alum that I can think of from my school. Yeah, I, I know you weren't in the same cluster, so I didn't know if you were as connected, but I just like saw that connection. I was like, what are the odds? Like yeah. two, like two people went in completely different directions sure. from like the same school. But Well, he's also more successful than me right now. I mean, it, it depends on like, how you look at success, you know, like in different circles. Uh, and... She's touring around the world as a solo artist. I think yeah, she well. wins. She wins. But I bet more girls and gays know who you are, though. Maybe. But I don't know. I went to one of his live shows and I was just blown away. Like mm -hmm. the audience was so eclectic. And I just thought like for, you know, a straight individual to attract, you know, such a different group of people. I was just like, yes, like mm -hmm. I love this. You know, I think. I'm sure you could relate, maybe, I don't know, but, like, I think a lot of the times, like, he, you know, got made fun of for being eccentric, and I just love that he always was like, well, I don't care, and I am straight, and I'm eccentric, and what? And I think that's really awesome, and that we need more of that. Mm -hmm. I saw one of his, like, live performances, too. He was, like, doing a set, and then he started just, like, putting on a bunch of bras. Yeah. And I was, like, a straight guy wearing bras, the representation. Yes! You know? Well, you know, I, I mean, not to, like, get too controversial, but... Um, I definitely, you know, loved that you were on Drag Race. I feel the more we can diversify, the better. Mm. And, you know, your straight story matters to me, mama. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yes. I, I'm not going to gas myself up, but I, I will say, like, I don't think that um, straight people need representation in drag because it's, like, it's open to them. Like, they just don't do it because they're too, like, insecure with themselves, too sure. worried what people will think. But I, I do think it's important for a lot of straight people out there to see some a certain another straight person embracing femininity and realizing that like oh their life isn't ruined it's not over right. they can do whatever 
and that it's yeah. okay to express yourself. And if mm-hmm. you want to, you know, be feminine, like why should you? Why should you not just because you're straight or you're yeah. you're born a male? Like I think that's so. Mm-hmm. So late. Yeah. And I think a lot of people's like homophobia and transphobia, it stems from straight people being insecure themselves or being worried. You know, there's outwardly projecting. And right. you know, once that wall, you just got to slowly chip away at that wall. Agreed. You know, we're all going to be skeletons one day. Agreed. Matters, yeah. Know. No, I loved it. I really did. I thought it was so cool. I was like, yes, if we can have, you know, straight girls, why can't we have straight guys? Like, I think open it up. You know, I'm waiting for a drag king, obviously. I would really mm-hmm. love to see that on the show. But I just think the more that we can diversify the types of contestants, the more the show is enriching our lives. Yeah. But back to your experience in school, you were actually very successful in dance, and you actually won the Presidential Scholar of Arts. Is it true you performed a dance recital for George Bush? I did. I mean, <laughs> honestly, I never saw him there. So I don't know that he actually came, but... Mm-hmm. I did meet him. I did go to the White House. I took the picture with all the smart scholars because basically, you know, there's smart scholars that they pick. I think it's like two per state. And I think at Mm. that time, the high school that I went to had three, which Mm. was just kind of like unheard of to have three from one school. But it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, not necessarily going to the White House, but I got to present my work on the Kennedy Center stage. Mm-hmm. And that was just, I mean, such a dream come true at like 18 years old. I, I'm just imagining like you're doing the recital and then you look over at an empty chair. But instead of your dad, it's where George Bush is supposed to be. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely don't remember him being there at all. Do you still have plans to like start your own like dance company? I do, you know, it's alongside the weed company. It's like, these are my Here. two like greatest <laughs> dreams, but a girl's got to eat. I got to pay the bills. So, yeah. you know, performing really kind of takes over yeah. for me. Messaging back all the sugar daddies. Yeah. Oh, I wish. <laughs> I never had a sugar daddy. If I wanted a sugar daddy, I still couldn't get one. So, you know. <laughs> oh, you go, you're one of the dolls now. You know, that's, you know, the dolls. You know, I don't know what you I think must be. Am I a little crazier? But, I must know. be sending out the wrong messages because I have not gotten hit up by inter- any sugar daddies. Uh, maybe on the wrong side. I, I you know. know, I'm not on any site. So maybe that's oh, well, there the there it problem. is, yeah. <laughs> you sit in like a personals in the mail or yeah. like on the, from the newspaper. Well, I just hear of all these people who get like DM'd and I'm just like waiting for my day that daddy slides into my DM and offers me, you know. Versace boots and a Michelin star meal. Yeah. Uh, I did an interview with Farah and she gave great advice. And, Which was? And by uh, great, great advice, I mean awful advice. Okay. She said, go to your message request, go to the hidden request. I do that. Find the people that have messaged you, hey, 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 a million times and just shoot them a message. Now that and, I won't do. Because yeah. if you're only going to write, hey, girl, you're not getting passed. That's, yeah. too, that's just, that's like, now it makes me look desperate because I have to message you after you've said, hey. Mm-hmm. At least like, you know, Tell me what you're going to lay down. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely shifty, and I would advise against it. But it got her Versace <laughs> boots, so. Did it really? Or, or I got her some Louboutins. I, I don't know said. if I believe this story. Yeah, yeah. That's one she tells. Laganja said Fair is a liar. <laughs> you're a There's li- the headline. You're a liar, Fair, and that's why Laganja don't like you. No, I love my sister, and I'm so happy for her trans journey, and mm-hmm. I loved the way, you know, she talked about it on this show. And uh, do you, and if you want to message those who say, hey, props to you, mama. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, just be safe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wrap it up before you strap it up. Yeah. <laughs> but, but with the dance, you've like done so many opportunities on top of drag race, including like, so you think you can dance. Uh, you've choreographed for Miley Cyrus. Yeah. Like wh- of, of all these like opportunities and things you've done, like what's been like your favorite one so far? Honestly, for me, most recently, which really moved me was working with Lady Camden. I did her Christmas mm. show, The Naughty Nutcracker, this last year mm. in San Francisco. And I really did get to be almost like a creative director. Like I I did things with lighting and helped her come up with the sort of ideas and the way things would work on top of the choreography. And I think that's ultimately like what I really want to do. Like I'm actually about to direct my first ever thing. Um, I'm on a show called Open To It, which is now available on Amazon. Um, And I think out TV too. And I'm actually about to direct my first episode. And I'm really kind of nervous for it. But mm-hmm. I always feel like if you're not nervous for something or you're not pushing yourself to grow, then, like, why are you an artist? Yeah. So I'm super excited about doing that because that's kind of, like, what I see for myself moving forward. Mm-hmm. What, what kind of series uh, is that? Gay Slutville. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's about op- being open and open relationships 
And is it I, more like, like talk show or more like? No, it's like a scripted show. Oh, scripted. Oh, it's like a, yeah, like a series, it's like, a like, a, like, a, like a fictional series. Okay, totally. And I play one of the drag queen characters on the show, so I've made several like little mini appearances. Mm-hmm. But uh, Frank, who is sort of the creative director of it all, asked mm-hmm. me to direct one of the episodes. So I'm okay. super excited for that because. She's in her Greta Gerwig era. I am oh really, gosh. you know, I'm, I'm, I, I love performing. Don't get me wrong, but I've done this for a decade. I've slammed my into more stages than you can imagine, and um, I think ever since the transition too, I've realized like I don't need drag as much as I once did. Mm-hmm. Like I really, I, I needed drag because it was the only way for me to express my femininity. And now that I'm comfortable in doing that myself, I find that drag is um, uncomfortable. And a lot of work and very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so I want to sort of like transition to being more, like I said, off camera and coming up with the sort of creative. And, you know, again, that's why I loved working with Lady Camden. She's 12 pounds soaking wet. She Mm -hmm. can do it over and over and it's no problem. She reminds you of a a younger you. She does. Absolutely. I mean, a lot lot more technical than I ever was because she's a ballerina and I was always like contemporary dance. Yeah. But uh, it was just fun to be able to sit back with my cigarette and be like, do it again, toots. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really relish in that sort of moment of being a part of it all, but not having to be the star. Do you think you're any closer towards that Miss Elliott collab? Gosh, you know, I'm going to say yes because I want to keep believing in it, but probably not. I went and saw her this last year, Uh paid my rent, sat fourth row overheard some people talking about how they were going to meet her at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I was super cray-cray and just, like, stuck around with them and, like, Mm -hmm. tried to sneak in to meet her. Definitely got denied. Definitely didn't get on the list. So, I I, I don't know. I mean, she follows me on Twitter. We've had some interaction there. If it is her running her Twitter mm -hmm. or X or whatever they call it now. Or even if you get, like, whatever, like, gay intern runs her Twitter, like, weaponize your blue check mark. I think it's possible. Wait, we don't have check marks on X anymore. Oh, buy your check mark. Uh Ah, girl, I ain't buying that. (laughs) No, ma'am. I'm I'm manifesting it for you. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. I really want it to happen. I know it will one day. I just don't know if I'm necessarily closer at this current time. (laughs) Hopefully it happens sooner than later. It's not whenever she's like 70 doing her her lifetime farewell tour. I don't care when it happens. I really don't. As long as it happens, I will be so grateful. Mm -hmm. As we were saying earlier, with all the skills you have in dance and your love of theater, Drag was kind of a natural progression for you. Sure. And according to your Wikipedia, you started doing drag in 2011. Okay. But (laughs) you actually were in drag performing way sooner than that, in 2006. There it is! I knew you were going to have an old photo for me. Yeah. This is iconic! cabaret. It is cabaret. Look at her, honey. (laughs) And I fought for this to happen, you know. Mm. Um, So, again, I went to Booker T. Washington. It was an art school. I don't know how we convinced them to let us do cabaret in high school, but we did. And I not only choreographed the show, but I was the MC, which is one of the leading roles. Mm -hmm. And in the revival with Alan Cumming, um, he does this bit where he dresses in drag for the opening of the second act and does the song Two Ladies, which traditionally by Joel Grey was done as male presenting with two ladies. But in Alan Cumming's version, he was also a lady. So... Mm -hmm. I was just like, we have to do this. I want to do this. And yeah, I got to do it and pull it (laughs) off. And gosh, look at how skinny I was. But the wigs are still just as bad. So hey, I love this one. Not this one. Yeah, this one's You know, I still wear a good shake and go bob to this day. Just imagine like the same character in Cabaret with little top hat, but with the big pink wig. Yeah, Um, okay. Feeling very attacked. Yeah, very. Yeah, I want the the Boz Lerman revival (laughs) of Cabaret. (laughs) But while that may have been one of your first performances in drag, as it were, it wasn't your per- first performance as Laganja. That happened in 2011 at Mickey's in WeHo. And Ooh, you have your facts wrong. That's what it says on the Wikipedia page. Oh, well, baby, the Wikipedia's wrong, Correct mama. me. Where was it? Okay, so it we're was... We're updating it. We're updating it right now. Okay, so it was at CalArts, which is hmm. the school where I went for my BFA. And it was for an event that we called CalArts is Burning, which was obviously based on Paris is Burning. Hmm. And that was really where I debuted Miss Laganja. Stripped down to marijuana pasties. I had on a short green Party City wig. And I had my two backup dancers, which I called and coined the shake. Do you know what that is? The shake? So, like, when a bunch of cannabis is, like, 
ground up. Oh, yeah. It's called yeah. shake, mm -hmm. but also like the dance move, like the shake. Mm. So that's what I called my dancers back then. And that was really like my first performance. And I was so enamored with the art form that that's when I entered the competition mm. at Mickey's. And that's when it like was my official start into the whole world. And unearthing new information here. You see? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's actually pictures of this also on my Facebook. Yeah, I might have skipped over it, finding the, the I think cabaret it would have been photos. 2010. 2010. That was when I first, because like at CalArts, we used to have this party every Thursday. It was like a big gallery. And all the artists would put their art up in the gallery mm -hmm. and everyone would like sing and dance and act. It was so cool. And so I started going to those in drag. And that was mm -hmm. sort of how the bug caught mm -hmm. on. But when you actually did start performing like in the venues, like yeah. Mickey's and WeHelp yeah. was obviously where you kind of got your start in the scene. But you started alongside your soon-to-be season six sister, Adore Delano. That's right. Were you and Adore like close friends in LA prior to Drag Race? You know, I mean, close friends? I don't think I would say that per se. Mm -hmm. It's not like we went over to each other's house and kikied all the time. But we were very friendly in the drag world, okay. in the drag scene. You would say you were friends. Oh, we were absolutely friends. Mm -hmm. But with Adore uh, being your friend, why did she let you walk out of the house like this? What's wrong with that? What's right with that? <laughs> well... You know, it's giving um, her real hair into a wig, which I think is really cool. There's a wig in there? There is a wig in there, Okay. Mama. I've pulled the front out and yeah. judged it into... See, you did go to Facebook. You are shady. <laughs> and look, I'm giving you, like, jewels on the side of the eye. That is very dry. She's giving you, like, a soft lip with a nice nose contour. Mm -hmm. I mean... It's hideous, I know. Especially the contour up in the receding hairline. Yikes. But for her first time out in drags. It's not the worst. It wasn't the worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I stand by it. It's honestly like the, how soft you were painting back then. I figured with like your background like theater and stuff, you really would have hit the paint. But this is this is soft. This is it was giving our early doll. You know, it it's... was definitely giving cover girl doesn't cover boy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but it, like I tried to do like the diamond appliques. I mean, mm. also, why do I look so sad? Like, why didn't she? I think she thought was she was a, fierce it was a mood. enough. It was a mood. Also, car lighting, never good. Like, yeah. you know, it was. I was set up it's, to fail. Looking back, like, this is the earliest photo I could find that you had posted in drag that wasn't cabaret. Okay. And that's why I was like, this is like the, the reveal for people. This is what you're like, guess what? I do drag now. Yeah. And I use my real hair and I'm sick. You're like, I'm using overhead lighting in, the, in my <laughs> Nissan. <laughs> It is a Nissan. Good uh -huh. job. Yep. Yeah, that was the, that was the photo. This is the promo. Also, look at the lash. The lash is kooky dooky. That was my next question. I was like so obsessed in the beginning of my drag career, like with like the weird lashes you would get at like Hot Topic or like uh, Spencer's. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Astranja. The whole idea was that I would be strange, which I guess in the end I still stuck to. I think when people think drag and strange, they picture like crazy costumes, couture, abstract. I don't think they meant your lashes are <laughs> uneven or crooked. <laughs> Or feathers. Like, it's my art. You just don't get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Period. I stand by it. <laughs> but but with like knowing Adora in LA and you yeah. guys both kind of like starting, did you kind of grow up in drag together and leading up to Drag Race? Yeah, I would say so for sure. And I would definitely say she was prettier than me for sure. Um, but I definitely brought it when it came to like the dancing. You know, she mm. was a singer. So she would sing live. I would dance the house down. So it would always go back and forth, right? Like, I would win one, she would win one. I would win one, then I'd win another, and then she'd win another. You know, it's like, so we went back and forth. But I think what's really cool about us is even though we were competing in this scene, we definitely rooted for each other. Mm -hmm. We definitely, like, wanted each other to succeed, you know, even on the show. But, get, but getting cast for the show, I feel like you created some of the most iconic moments from the show, like, completely changed the game for workroom entr entrances. You made some of the most memorable quotes. And while we look back as fans and, like, reverence of these moments... sure. It was a different experience for you as they were airing. Yeah. What was it like for you when all these things were happening on TV for the first time? I mean, it was hard. It, it was really hard. You know, I thought when I got off the show that even though I didn't win, I was going to be like adored and like, you know, people were going to think I was funny. And, you know, when I was filming the show, my producers were laughing their ass off and they would be like, oh, my God, we love that. Do that again. Do it even bigger and hold it out for longer, you know? And so... I really thought I smashed it. I really thought like, even though I didn't win the show, like I was funny. And then, you know, when the preview started coming out and we saw right off the bat, like Bianca was throwing shade towards me and I was like in the blinds. I was like, wait, what? And then they did the first snippet of the first episode and I just saw how annoying I was. And I was like, oh no, like. You saw the real you for the first time. <laughs> I was like, they got the girl. They got the girl. <laughs> and, 
you know, I come from a musical theater background, as we were saying. So I'm the type of person that when coached definitely wants to give the director or the producers what they want. And so I never even thought twice about the fact that that could then be sort of used against me. But I always say to this day that, you know, I am who I am. I am crazy. I am kooky. I do say yes, mama, when I'm with my best friends. And I'm never going to not own that. Anything that you saw on that show, you're right. I did say it. Now, was I literally walking around going, oh, cur, every three seconds? No, I wasn't. Did I have beautiful, sweet moments where I cried and got soft? Absolutely. You know, but they chose the ones that were like me being hysterical or me being crazy and funny. You never really got to see kind of the through line. Um, And I'm really grateful for that. Honestly, it took many years. I had a whole issue with alcohol. You know, I really went into a dark place after the show aired because everyone was making fun of me and called me fake and annoying and even called me the villain, which I never understood because I wasn't mean to anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took a lot of time for me to like really well, sort you were of... mean to that one old lady. I wasn't mean to her. That was funny. It's called humor. Oh, well. Get into her. And she caught Australia. So. <laughs> um, and like even that, you know, like that was funny, but they made it look like it wasn't funny. and. Mm-hmm. You know, I just learned that that is reality TV, but ultimately I'm so grateful for it because a year later, everything became iconic and everyone was quoting it. And it was Mm -hmm. like, all of a sudden the script flipped and people loved it. So I had to kind of ride that wave. Mm -hmm. Um, But I am so grateful to this day that I was my crazy zany self because I think that's what set me up for the success I have now. You know, I'd rather be hated and remembered than be safe and forgotten. But as you talk about your alcoholism and depression that you Mm -hmm. experienced, was most of that due in part because of Drag Race or were there other elements outside of the show? No, I definitely think there were other elements. I wish I could blame it all on Drag Race and be like, it was your fault. But no, it was my fault too. Uh, Again, I was struggling with my gender identity, even though I didn't know it. And ultimately, you know, I had gone to a party school. So partying and alcohol, that was definitely something that was already in my veins, in my blood. Your high school or either college? College. I was actually pretty good in high school. I was like very mm. straight A's. I think I didn't start drinking till like my senior year, like fall semester. Like I was really, I grew up very scared to break the rules. Mm. I wanted to be the perfect child. I saw what happened to my sister for going the other way. And so I wanted to be very straight and narrow, pun intended. Um, but I think what happened is after the show, you know, instead of really getting into therapy and confronting those issues of being on national television and the scene as sort of a fool, I chose to drink my problems away. And that, of course, led to other problems like not having safe sex and uh, getting into other drugs. And, you know, it was sort of a spiral down. Mm. And, you know, I'm so grateful that eventually I did get into therapy and I did catch myself. And I was actually sober for three years, not from cannabis, but from alcohol and drugs. And, you know, I always say, like, those were the best three years of my life. And, like, in my dream world, I'm vegan and I don't drink and, like, I get back to that beautiful place. Now, again, it's a dream world. I don't think that will ever really happen. Right. Me being vegan, yeah. I just right. choose as a choice and I choose yes. <laughs> being vegan and in Missy Elliott video, that's the, you know. Yeah, no. So, you know, now I, I, I have a much more healthy dialogue with alcohol and, and, and I'm always much more aware of my intake. And, you know, my job is in nightclubs where drinking is so prevalent. So I had to figure out a way to have a better relationship with it. But I think especially in the beginning when I first got off the show, it became a really bad crutch. And it was something that I used, again, much like I used cannabis, to numb myself from the truth. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I love therapy. Shout out to Renato, my therapist at the Trans Wellness Center. He has helped change my life in so many ways. And You know, both my parents were high school counselors for 30 plus years. So I'm really lucky that I grew up in a home where we did talk about our emotions and we did talk about the importance of being authentic with someone who is neutral. And so, yeah, I continue to rep therapy and tell people like we need to break that stigma because it is not only life changing, it is life affirming. A lot of the guests that I talked to on the show, um, I feel like had the same message, but I feel like therapy was like a big game changer. It's like a constant thing where it's like life or struggles, ups and downs, and they found a therapist and things kind of like, you know. Yeah, I think a therapist, a good therapist at least, will give you tools in which to access your life in a different way. So I always find like with Renato, what's so impressive is 
he'll say the most simplest things. Like I'll be describing a friend of mine that I have struggles with and he'll say something like, well, your friend is a fish and you are a bird and there's beautiful things about being able to swim and there's beautiful things about being able to fly. But at the end of the day, that person's never going to be a bird, no matter how much you want them to be. And it's like something so simple like that, like really gets me to reframe at how I look at things. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just find it to be so helpful. And that's why like, I'm so committed to it. And I, every time I have a session with him, I'm like, okay, let's schedule the next date. (laughs) Because I just know like, it's important to check in with yourself, with someone else who can help you evaluate your life. Yeah. You need someone to have you like, compartmentalize these things that are happening in your life into simple things like animals and colors and shapes. And, I mean, for yeah. me, yes, it works. <laughs> I need it to be simplified because I get so, you know, oh, I want them to do this and I want it, I want them to do that. And it's like, well, why? You know, mm-hmm. instead of celebrate who they are for, for being the fish, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. I guess I work really well with metaphors. Yeah. It's, it's good for okay, me. Like you and a friend are arguing, you're like, you know what? You're a fish. And you leave. And they're like, what? I'll never hear from you again. Right. The last thing she said to me was, I was a fish. No, no, I never saw her again. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but shifting topics, uh, at one point, you were a member of the House of Edwards. Yes. But for those that don't know, like, how did you get involved in the House of Edwards and become Alyssa's drag daughter? Sure. So I began working for Justin Johnson, which is Alyssa's real name, many, many moons ago. I was actually working for her competitor studio. And when they stopped hiring me, I was like, I'm going to call up this other studio owner and see if, you know, he wants me to work for him. And sure enough, Justin was like, well, why don't you come down to the studio? We'll do an audition. I'll see if you fit here and we'll go from there. So, I mean, I show up to his studio in like a full, simple sequin outfit. Like this. Basically. Yeah. And she already was like, girl, what is all this coming into the studio? And didn't know. But after she saw me teach and she saw how I was with the students, um, you know, I began working for her. I worked for her for a whole decade at Beyond Belief. And I knew Alyssa did drag, but it was something we did not talk about. Like, she kept her life very separate. So when she was at the dance studio, it was Justin, it was dance. I wouldn't say she turned down her queerdom, but it was dialed back. And, and she, you know. Sounds like a different character. Well, I think at the end of the day, you know, we're in Texas. And mm. she didn't want to face the backlash of people being like, who is this queer person, you know, leading these students? So, you know, she tried to really play that sort of tough, you know, but yet still encouraging role. And so anyways. It wasn't until her season where she couldn't do that anymore and students and mothers started seeing her on television as Mm -hmm. Alyssa. And then that's kind of what changed everything for me because once she was open about it, I wanted to know everything. I began asking her things and I began to go to pageants with her and, you know, it it became my obsession. And I remember when I first started drag, she was like, why? Please stop. You're so talented. Why would you want to do drag? And... It's so sweet now when I look back and and the fact that she, you know, she just believed in my talent so much as a choreographer and she didn't want me to derail my dreams to pursue this thing that I found really fun. Um, But I think now she would say that she's glad I did because ultimately it it has been full circle and it is leading me back more into the choreography world. Um, But basically that's how I got in the House of Edwards is I had always worked for her. We were brothers first. And then we became sisters. And, you know, same with Shangela. I knew her outside of the studio as DJ, as someone who, you know, backup danced for Alyssa. And it wasn't until she was on Drag Race that, like, that whole thing sort of became a connection. And, you know, traveling the world with House of Edwards truly Mm -hmm. changed my life. Believe it or not, before them, I was so scared to talk. I was a dancer. We Mm -hmm. weren't encouraged to speak. We were encouraged to move. But being with those two, I mean, I had to get in there and get out there and stall for them while they would Mm -hmm. be changing. And I remember I would have full on panic attacks, just like what you saw on TV being like, I don't know, what am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? And they would just be like, just get out there. And it really forced me to come into my own. And so Mm -hmm. I'm just so grateful that, you know, I got to really grow up in the house of Edwards. I can't think of a better drag family. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, even to this day, we're we're still a very strong unit and we still love and have each other's back, even though obviously we have all blossomed and grown in our different ways. Yeah, I, I knew that 
you became you met Alyssa through like dancing and like the studios and everything. Yeah, I didn't realize that drag was a non-factor at that point. Right, you guys first met. Totally, I had no idea. I, I assumed that was part of it. No, no. I mean, like I said, I'd heard the rumors. I'd you know seen pictures from friends, but I didn't really know. It wasn't until the show that it was confirmed, and then I was like, all right. Mm-hmm. Ding, ding, ding. Miss Thing, what's this? I want to do this. This yeah. looks fun. What's this about? It didn't set off any alarm bell. She shows up for a recital. She only has half an eyebrow. Yeah, no, no. no. Like I said, she kept it very separate. Mm. Very separate. I think that's why when I walked in in a sequin vest to teach dance class, she was like, whoa, 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 baby. Slow that roll. <laughs> You're doing too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, imagine Alyssa telling someone they're doing too much. Yeah. As you mentioned, like you're no longer a part of the House of Edwards. Uh, again, we don't have to talk about anything you're uncomfortable with. But, yeah. But can I ask, like, what led to like your separation from the house? Sure. Well, I will say that I am with them. Um, we had what we like to call an extended timeout. Okay. There was a period where we were on extended timeout. We didn't talk. Um, you know, I don't think I was excommunicated from the house. Right. I just, I just wasn't, like I said, working with them. I wasn't traveling with them. But really, at that point, both their careers had skyrocketed, so they weren't even working with each other. You know, it wasn't like the House of Edwards was doing gigs and I was excluded. It just it just kind of all happened naturally, and, and we did. We went our different ways, um, and it was sad. You know, I just, I love Justin so much. There's no one more that I enjoy kicking on the phone about nothing with, you know? And so not having that for, I don't remember how many years. It was many years, like maybe four or five. Uh, it, it, it was sad and it, it, it took away a part of my life that brought me so much joy. But I can say now that like we both grew in such different ways and it made us so much stronger. You know, I think our relationship will never be what it was, but that's for the better. You know, I mean, she told me when we finally reconnected, like, you know, I just always thought you'd be my little brother. Like I never... I never thought that that relationship would change. And she was like, that was so wrong of me to think that because, you know, look at you, you're, you know, you're my beautiful sister and it doesn't matter the age or the difference, you know, you are a part of me and I'm a part of you. And I think it's really just unique that we've been able to reconnect in that way. And it's something that I always longed for. And I think she did too. Um, And so, yeah, we have so much fun now and it's just like old times where she'll call me and, She'll kiki with me and be like, how the hormone titties doing? And I'll flash her. And, you know, it's just we have silly (laughs) nonsense fun. And I'm just so grateful for that because um, even in those years where we were on timeout, like the love was always there. And I know the same for her, for me. But you had so many journeys. And one of the biggest ones have been over the past few years with your gender journey, like gender identity. Yeah. First, like kind of learning that you were non-binary and now more recently identifying as a trans woman. Yeah. Why do you think it took? Up until your 40s. Whoa, mama. Whoa, slow down. (laughs) Slow down. I'm 35. I just turned 35. Don't you put me in my 40s, bitch. But but, but why do you think it took to this point in your life to realize like your trans identity? (laughs) You know, I think fear is a huge part of it. I think uh, not being able to see myself in representation was a huge part of it. I didn't know what trans was growing up in Texas. There were no trans people, open trans people. Mm. The only things I knew were hot mess, you know, from Christian Siriano on Project Runway. Um, trans jokes on Sex in the City and, and Will and Grace. And, and it was derogatory. It wasn't a mm. positive thing. So I think it took me a long time to accept it because I was scared. I was afraid that I would never receive love. And I mean, I'd be lying if I said that I still don't have that fear because I do. But ultimately, I've learned the power of loving myself is so much more important than what others think or what it may cause for my love life down the road. Mm -hmm. Um, I think also Corona or the pandemic. I always say Corona and it confuses people. What do you call it? Did you call it the pandemic? Like COVID. COVID. That's the other yeah, word. I always cor- forget you, that one. You said like, because of Corona. I was like, oh, we're talking about beer. Well, like, right. I think that's why I call it Corona because then it sounds more like a fun thing I know of. <laughs> um, but it really forced me to deal with myself. And there was something about when my real hair grew out and it touched the back of my neck, it just clicked. Mm. I was non-binary. I started wearing dresses, but I still kept the beard and I was still trying to like you know, conform in a way. And Corona allowed me the space and time away from everyone else to really look at it, 
look at it in a different way and and, and look at what I wanted. And gave you a chance to try before you buy. Exactly. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I got to shop it out. COVID and was a trial period for your transness. It really so. was. And it was such a beautiful moment in my life because I discovered that I'd had this answer within me all along. It's something I knew. I mean, you know, Sonique tells me this story all the time that when she first met me many moons ago when she was on Drag Race on the patio of Mickey's, I walked up to her and without really even introducing myself or saying anything, I just straight up told her, I think I'm trans and I don't know what to do. Now, I don't have a recollection of this conversation because I was probably or, And so I believe her in that I know I've struggled. I did struggle with this for many, many years before this you know, mm-hmm. transition. It just it was Corona and the stop of the world that allowed me to go, OK, I can't not do this. You know, I always would say to people as a joke, like, well, I'll come out when my parents die. But I realized in Corona, like, I don't want my parents to die and not know the real me. You know, I want them to see the beautiful trans woman that I am. And I want them to see that I have the strength and the courage to live this life, even though it's going to come with trials and tribulations. I don't want to divulge this conversation too much back onto Drag Race. But sure. I feel like it's kind of like a relevant because you've mentioned in interviews before that Drag Race isn't really the best competition setting for you and like mm-hmm. format and everything. But with so many changes that you've gone through in the past few years, have you like reconsidered that and like possibly going back to like the show or is it still that's a bygone era you glad you did it but it's not for you i would say ultimately like 70 percent, it's a no for me mm. i'm i don't have interest in going back um but there is a part of me i think after all stars especially you know and mm. i realize wow so many people especially now who are watching the show didn't watch my season they don't even know what logo tv is and so it would be an opportunity for me to expose myself to a whole different, you know, demographic. But I just think exactly in what you said, it's not the right setting for me. You know, mm-hmm. I am competitive, but with myself, not really with others. And I just, I think it would give me too much PTSD. I think it could be detrimental to my mental health. And that's why I always say, like, I want to go back to the show as a choreographer. You know, I want to go back as a special guest, but to compete again, it just, it scares me. And, you know, I'm, I talked earlier about facing your fears and doing things that are, you know, outside your comfort zone. And that's why I don't say there isn't a still 30%, seven, eight, nine, ten, Yeah. 30% chance that mm-hmm. I wouldn't do it again. Um, because I don't know, I don't know what life holds in these next couple of years. And, you know, maybe once I do get my breasts and I'm further along in my transition and feel better about myself, Maybe I will want to share that with the world, but I always like to think that I am sharing who I am every single day through my Mm -hmm. social media, through the other shows that I've been on. And that ultimately, um, it's not that I, I don't want to say I don't need it because of course we all need it. Drag Race changes your life, even if you go on there and make a fool of yourself. From like a a human standpoint, I feel like you shouldn't put yourself in a situation where it's like traumatizing for you. But as a reality TV fan, it makes great TV. I know. know? Like we are like, a Laganja breakdown, I feel like we haven't had that in a good All-Stars yet. We need something like that. I know, but I'm not trying to go on a show and have a breakdown yeah. again, you know? And if I am, I want it to be my own show. That's, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I feel like where I get to edit my breakdown. Well, not yeah. even that, but, you know, I just would want it to be for something, I guess, where it, it would be more authentic. Mm-hmm. And I'm just scared because I'm still the same person. That's the thing. It's like, yes, I have changed. Yes, I have matured. but I'm still that person. If a producer encouraged me to act crazy or encouraged me to, you know, be over the top, I would do it. I know I would do it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, contestants aren't as willing to be as wild as we once were. That's true. You know, back in my heyday, honey. You can take us back to the good old days. You know, back in my heyday, we were just balls to the walls. (laughs) But I think so many people now have grown Mm -hmm. up with the show and they've seen what that did to contestants. And so there is this sort of like watching your personality to make sure you're not rubbing anyone the wrong way. Whereas like, yeah, when I went on that show, I mean, I did not know Jack shit about reality TV. So I just was kooky and crazy. And Alyssa's one advice was keep the cameras on you. And baby, I did that. That's true. That's true. You are a main character in that season. I definitely gave main character energy for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Or at the very least, like reoccurring side character that everyone yeah. writes fanfic about. You know, totally. like, like that person. Totally. <laughs> All right, well, with that, that is the end of the interview and the end of my cards. But before you go, I want to give you something to thank you for coming in today. 
Um, and, but I guess it's one more question, because I'm curious. Okay, I can't wait to see what, what this is. What is it that resonated with you so much, the writings of Ryan O'Connell? Wait, I think I know them for poetry. Yeah, he used to do poetry. I was about to say, I don't know them for books. Yeah, he just recently said he started writing books. He had like a nonfiction book, and this is his first like fiction book, but he oh did poetry. Oh my God, you're making me feel like I'm smart. Books but are the new he did poetry. For him. Poetry, yeah. And that's what I knew them for. And I think why I connected to their work so much is there was a vulnerability. There was a sense of authenticity through his words that I really resonated with. And I felt like he was not afraid to kind of go to dark places. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, you know, I'm seen as such this like outlandish person, but the truth is like, there is a lot of darkness to me. I, I have struggled with that. I think that's what makes any comedian or actor great is like this sort of duality. And I feel like Ryan really captures that in his poetry. Mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be an interesting read by someone that, that is. I knew you had oh read my god, wait! Before. And he's an actor. He got his own TV show. Yeah, he he also was a part. Of, I love that TV show. What is it called? Special? I think so. I think so. Is it say on here? Yes, Netflix special. Oh my gosh, you really took me back. This is crazy. Like. I haven't talked about him in forever. Mm -hmm. This is like old school. Yeah, you mentioned like his poetry, I think back in like 2000, probably 12 or so. It was like yeah. Before Drag Race. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I may actually have to read this. Mm -hmm. I actually did read my very first book. I didn't read the book, I read 80 pages. My girlfriend took me to a spa where we weren't allowed to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And so she like gave me this book about like um the joy of like not overworking basically it's like about how to like work less but get more from it so interesting i mean for those two hours that i read the 80 pages i was like mm -hmm. i love reading yeah now i haven't picked it up since <laughs> i did borrow the book from her but i i have this new theory this year that instead of watching tv late at night because you know screen time is like really bad for your mm -hmm. rem cycle i think yeah to read so I think you've actually helped me here. You've given me a gift. I've started your new journey. You, you, can, be a, you can be a bookworm. And you really have reminded me of a time when I loved poetry. And that was like a thing that I was like mm -hmm. super into. It's so funny. I, I don't really look at poetry anymore. But I think when I was more like focused on being a choreographer, I used poetry as source material to create movement. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Thank you for this. That you are giving me this, right? Yeah, that's for okay. you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> make sure, make sure to return that back when you're done. No, okay, no, that's, well, that's, that's all for you. That's I all didn't for you. Know. Yeah. Go ahead. And maybe if we, maybe if we go through another Corona, you'll have time to sit down okay. with it. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. <laughs> like, I know it's not like the the type of material that he wrote that you resonated with back then. Yeah. But I still thought it might be interesting, kind of revisit like an older time with the same author with it with a very scarily similar story in a certain aspects, but um. right. No, that's so thoughtful. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And thank you for letting my furry whiny friend come on today. We appreciate you having us. This yeah. was a lot of fun. No, I'm, I'm happy you both came. I'm glad. Like, I feel like a lady adds a certain level of like charm to the show that we don't normally have here. She did. Like, she as you did. said before, I've had many dogs, but never an official canine. You so. know, and look, you may have showed some ugly photos, but, you know, Adore was here looking menacing the whole time. So I feel like it all evened out. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, strike, we strike the balance here. Yeah. I'll give it to me straight. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> But so do you have anything coming up? Do you have any projects or tours or things that are happening for you right now? Sure. So I definitely am working right now on Muse Me Season 3. Um, it's a series with my best friend where he basically transforms me every episode. He does my makeup, my styling, my hair, and then he takes the photo. And then at the end of each episode, you see the high art fashion photography that he creates. It's also really a lot about being DIY. I think... You know, we didn't have a huge budget in Corona. We still don't today. So a lot of like the things that he does with me, for instance, um, this last episode that we just shot, he used jello and ice and cellophane wrapped around my body with a corset from Amazon. So it's all about how you can be creative on a dime. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working on the third season of that. I'm also working on my debut album that has been long coming for many years. It's gone through yeah. three different names. It was Exhibit A, then it was going to be Daily Basis this last year, but now I can finally say this year it will release. I truly believe this, and it's going to be called High Conic. High Conic, there yes. it is. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, I think this year I'm focusing more on me. So expect to see some, some physical changes and hopefully some more emotional mm. changes, I think. As someone who vlogs their life, a lot of people have gotten to know me through my content on YouTube. 
And I am excited to show people the person that I really have always wanted to be, but didn't have the tools or the resources to become. Mm -hmm. And I think this year is really going to be that year. So yeah, definitely check out my YouTube every Thursday at 420 Eastern Standard Time. Oh, you actually have the set time, 420? I do, Oh, yeah. that's fun. Yeah. So check out my content there and, and then just stay tuned on my socials and my website to see where I travel. No tour plans as of now, but I know that that will change and uh, I'll definitely be out on the road very soon. <laughs> and you can find me right here. Uh, make sure to like, comment, subscribe so you don't miss a single guest. And yeah, join us next time whenever we have somebody else. Okay. <laughs> and lady, of course. Yeah. And of La course, Lady is now a recurring guest. Okay. So. And of course, as always, stay sickening. Oh, that's what we say. That's what we say. On, <laughs> that's what I always say to end things. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. And thank you again to Scentbird for sponsoring this episode. You can scan the QR code or use my coupon code 55Maddie to get up to 55% off your first month. Links in the description.